This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast. Diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 176 is brought to us by Bybit. One thing I believe, and I think a lot of you probably believe this too, is no matter who wins this election this coming week in the United States, Bitcoin is still going to do quite well. And imagine the chance to trade and earn Bitcoin while you're trading. You know, a lot of you don't have any. A lot of you don't have as much as you would like. Well, there's one way to fix that. Trade on Bybit and get rewarded at the same time. Go down to the Bybit blog in the show notes. Click on it. Read it. Go down to the very bottom and click my affiliate link. Get yourself started. Get yourself connected into this ecosystem. And you'll be automatically eligible for contests, giveaways, draws, airdrops. And you can even just buy your crypto right there on their spot mark. You can do so many things with Bybit because with Bybit, membership has its rewards. It is the 10 Minute Contrarian Podcast, Sunday edition, once again. Uh, yesterday was a relocation day for me because uh, that is just the life of a nomad. <laughs> you have these sometimes. And, uh, and one thing before we start, to uh, not really a programming note, just a channel note. Uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube and for those of you who enjoy some of the content that I put out on YouTube uh, and, and those of you who like to comment and participate, uh, these past three weeks on YouTube have been really messy. Uh, nobody sees it unless you're, you're looking at it on the back end. But every time they go through an update or an upgrade, which they're going through right now, uh, some reason it, comments just get completely lost. So if you've been noticing that yourself, uh, I do apologize on their behalf. Um, but I have noticed it too on my uh, my Blueberry Markets video. There were a handful of people who made uh, some really really nice endorsements on there, and then somebody else who made an accusatory comment and then my representative Ben came on and uh, corrected him. I would have liked the world to see all of those things, but um, they are gone and disappeared forever. And then on the on subsequent videos, comments have disappeared as well. So um, I would really like some good YouTube comment engagement on this episode. I think uh, you guys are, at least my 10-minute contrarian listeners, are quite uh, well adjusted for the most part and can add a lot more than they will detract in, in the comment section as far as talking about topics uh, that we're about to talk about t- today. Just know that if you don't see your comment show up, uh, that just, that just means we're not quite through this whole nonsense with YouTube, but we might be. So please participate anyway if you have something to say. Uh, but from where I sit on the back end creator side here, it's been quite frustrating these last few weeks. Uh, But I have been talking about this episode for months now, and we are finally here. I cannot put it off any longer because the election is in a couple days here in the States. And uh, I'm going to do my best to not commentate too much. Um, I said before, I don't like doing it, even though sometimes I do it anyway. Uh, But there is this fear, and I think it's a logical fear, and I think it is a realistic fear, uh, that regardless of the outcome of the election here in the United States, there is a pretty high chance that the losing side will not accept uh, the overall result. And again, it does make sense. From the left side, I don't know if it would make a whole lot of logical sense, but we have seen that the, the, the powerful people on that side will stop at absolutely nothing to get their way and to make sure Donald Trump does not become president. If you remember last time when he did, he was not supposed to. Uh, The odds were heavily stacked against him, and he won anyway. And uh, the day after that happened is when the whole vitriol wagon really got uh, cranked up to 100. And the main reason is, and I'm not going to say it completely out loud here, if you know, you know, but there is a certain organization that every president has played ball with um, since Kennedy. Uh, regardless if they were Democrat or Republican, and uh, Donald Trump was the first one who did not. Uh, And this entity is very, very, very powerful. Uh, And this is really where a lot of uh, the Trump hate has come from, you know, the propaganda arm of this particular machine. And, you know, once you are aware of it, it really is just a matter of you deciding if you want to buy into this propaganda or not. Uh, But either way, I think it's all going to continue. Um, It's just a matter of how severe. Now, if uh, Kamala wins, uh, then I do think the right would have a a pretty good reason to be suspicious here. And and here is why. I'm only approaching this from a logical 
standpoint, or as logical as I can. You guys know I do lean right. But if after the 2020 election, or right at the 2020 election, the country really was right about 50-50, all right, just take that number and start with that. In the four years after Election Day 2020, let's take the people who are generally undecided. Now, everybody kind of has a lean, right? But there are people who will vote for uh, a Democrat one year and then a Republican the next four years and then, you know, rotate back and forth, you know, whatever. People who don't always vote one way. You know, these are the people you are trying to really sway over to your side. Now, in the past four years, how good of a job has the left done when it comes to this? You know, I don't think they've really swayed anybody. It's been all negatives. It's been all quite unpopular moves they have made. And if they have done anything, they've only done anything to their own constituents, their own hardcores, which from a strategic standpoint, you didn't even really need to do. They're going to be on your side anyway. You, know, you need to get those people in the middle. And I think they have done a terrible, terrible job of this. If anything, people have moved right due to what they've seen these past four years. You know, I'm not going to sit here and list off what those things are because now we're taking things in a direction I don't think we need to be taking things. Um, but I would need two hands to count them. Let's put it that way. You, know, you have seen publicly people move from Democrat to Republican. You've seen a couple go from Republican to Democrat, but not many. The majority of what you've seen is people going from left to right. And the left just continues on the exact same talking points they've been using this entire time. You know, they know that very few people look at Kamala Harris and say, you know, that is somebody I really, really want to get behind. They're doing what they did four years ago. They're just turning this into a, a yes or no vote for Donald Trump. But they're using the same talking points. And I think people have decided not to fall for those same talking points this time around. And I will say for the Trump side as well, you have had people come out, such as uh, J.D. Vance, you know, the, the vice presidential candidate, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, RFK, uh, Vivek. And I think that they have done a very good job speaking to those people in the middle. This is, like, again, this is something the left has just seemed to completely neglect for some reason. And, uh, you know, these people, the people I just mentioned, they are probably unpopular with people who are already hardcore left. But again, that's not who you're trying to get. You know, you're trying to get those people in the middle. And I think that the right has gained people stuck in the middle through this newer batch of people who have chosen to align with Trump. It just seems like yet another net positive for the right to where the left just isn't doing anything like this. They just continue to pander to the same people who are already hardcores. Strategically, it just makes no sense. So if you start with 50-50 and understand that sentiment has pretty much only traveled in one direction, I think a Donald Trump victory should occur. Now, again, I don't want people to go in the comments section and talk about election interference and things like that. If you want, if you want to do that, I want to redirect you to an episode we did here on the 10 Minute Contrarian podcast called Chill the F Out. You know, be better than these people, zoom out, take a step back, read the board, and adjust your money accordingly. Because regardless of who wins, if they don't do their job, bad governments typically only affect poor and middle class people. The financially free, on up to the wealthy, generally don't care as much. And that needs to be us. But uh, those are my thoughts on the election itself. Actually, no, one more point I did forget. I could edit it, but I'm going to be lazy here and just say it now. Uh, media distrust in the United States has absolutely skyrocketed. I've seen numbers to where like, people ask, do you trust mainstream media, which is all driven by the left, you know, fall as low as 12%. And I've seen maybe like 30% on the high end. You know, This was quite a departure from what we saw in 2020, where the numbers weren't tremendously high, but they weren't that low. You know, so again, if you start at 50-50 and you factor all these things in, you know, you're going to tell me that Kamala Harris is going to win? I don't see it. But anyway, again, that's not us. We do nothing but read the chessboard once the moves are made and decide what the next move needs to be. 
So uh, for the sake of this episode, let's maybe try to get ahead of some of the things we might be able to expect for the types of things that we care about here on the Tim McIntrarian podcast and what a Kamala Harris win or a Donald Trump win might do for those things. Now, I want to start with the recession, and you've probably heard me talk about this before. You know, there's people saying, you know, soft landing, no landing. Uh, The government has made recessions illegal. I've heard this one. Uh, This is all, to me, very top-of-the-market talk. You know, there's always rhetoric like this at or near the very top of a market. And then a recession predictably happens, and then we look back and we we laugh at this rhetoric and how foolish it is. And then, you know, eight, ten years later, we make the same mistakes. Uh, But I'm not ruling it completely out. Uh, What I'm saying is if it does happen... And regardless of who is president, we are ruled by a nameless, faceless cabal of people. And I was in that cabal. Uh, The way I would do it would be as such. If Kamala wins, um, and I want the left to be in power because the left typically falls in line with what I want to be accomplished. You know, like I said before, Donald Trump and this new wave of Republicans does not. So if it is Kamala... And I would like to see her remain on board for another four years after this four-year term. The way I would approach it is I would pull the release valve and dump the economy fairly soon. Now, the reason for this is, you know, I've already got my person elected. If we can go ahead and just eat the pain for a little bit and have this recession and give ourselves as much time as possible to come out of it, by the next election. You know, strategically, I think that's the best way to go. I mean, wouldn't you? you know, doesn't that make the most amount of sense? To where if Donald Trump wins, then I would wait until later in the term. So I would allow this, you know, one or two years of whatever it's going to look like, whether it's going to be prosperous, whether it's going to be not, you know, whether it's just going to be more of the same. And then halfway through, maybe, you know, into that third year or so, then, and remember, we've already waited three more years before pulling the plug. So whatever recession is happening is just going to get worse. Then I would release the hounds and just let the thing completely collapse. And so we can say, hey, you remember how prosperous it was back when Joe Biden was president? And you know how shitty it is right now? Yeah, you should probably vote for us again. Because Donald Trump is the reason why your stocks crashed. Donald Trump is the reason why you got laid off. Uh, But if I was going to do it, it would make a lot more sense to do it later in the term, closer to the next election. Because we said the Fed pretty much controls things at this point. The Fed should not be a political animal, but it is. And even though we always keep thinking we're hitting critical mass, the Fed just keeps coming up with tricks to prolong things. So maybe there are some tricks we have yet to see. I don't know. But again, my predictions are based in nothing more than pure self-interest. And that's why I'm going to say this this year because I bombed last year, but I I crushed this year with my overall predictions. If you want to go back to this past January and check out all my predictions episodes, it was all pretty much based on the fact that they were not going to let things crash in an election year. And it was going to be generally bad for the dollar and good for everything else. And it pretty much has been. Uh, So I'm using that same logic to not really predict when the recession is going to occur, but give a general idea based on who wins the presidency. When I think it would make the most sense to make it happen. And I really do think these recessions don't happen organically, at least not completely. And I think uh, the people who matter, I think the really rich people out there, they know it's happening. You know, we've seen what's happened with gold, gold reaching new highs, mainly because sovereign nations just keep buying it. And dollar detractors might say it's an anti-dollar play. I don't think it is. Yeah, I think it's more of an anti-everything play. And then I was having this argument with somebody in the past couple of weeks. You know, they were saying how great the economy is. And I said, well, no, I think the economy and the market are two different things. And if things really were all that great, if things were not really rotting from the inside, which I think they are, then why would the Fed drop interest rates the way they did? 
You know, and why would they drop it 50 basis points? You know, if the economy was really doing that great, you wouldn't need to do that. You know, and if you look at a chart of the S&P or the NASDAQ or anything, it seems to be kind of rounding off at the top because nothing is really doing all that great except for NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is literally carrying the entire market. You know, there's nothing healthy about that. So either way, I would say we are due. You know, have we been due for a while? Yes. But what I also said in those predictions episodes, uh, in particular the macro one, is you know, go back to that Fed chart that I provided you on the macro prediction episode and watch what it does before every recession. Rates go up, they flatten out, they come down, and as they are coming down is when every recession we have ever had has occurred since the early 1980s. And we are currently in that falling rate process. So it's all there. It's just a matter of when. And what we really try to do here as financial preppers on this show is to make sure that we're ready for any situation that gets thrown at us. Now, if alpha is there, we don't pass on it. But we also make sure from an investing standpoint and a banking standpoint and a sovereignty standpoint that we are covered regardless of what happens. So what might happen if Kamala Harris wins the presidency? Well, I, from a financial standpoint, really not much different than what we're seeing right now. I mean, there's always the, the fear of the recession, but um, it's, I think it's just going to be more of an extension of what we're already seeing. You know, we really weren't ruled by Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden didn't make any real decisions on anything. It was that nameless, faceless group of people in the background. And why would that be any different this time around? So I don't think there's too much interesting going on there. I don't think there's really too much to predict. I just think it's going to be an extension of what we're already seeing. Uh, now, if Donald Trump wins, then things could get a lot more, uh, I want to say, unpredictable. Because this could be a Trump presidency we haven't seen before because he might actually get support of the House and the Senate this time as well, which he did not completely have before, which is why, and I haven't said it, you know, a lot of people, myself included, were quite disappointed in his presidency because a lot of things he said he was going to do, he just didn't do. Uh, and maybe he wasn't allowed to do it, but, you know, don't say you're going to do it if you can't do it. Um, but for the purpose of this show, let's just assume that he wins the presidency and Republicans take the House and the Senate, which there is a decent probability of occurring. And I'm not talking about in the polls. If, if you've learned anything, we always trust polls, and then polls always seem to betray us back. And then four years later, we end up falling for the same crap. And it's the same thing this year with betting markets. I don't trust those either. Uh, but anyway, let's say for the sake of argument, for the sake of this show, that a Trump victory also gives him the, uh, the House and the Senate. Now, when it comes to his actual cabinet, don't think it's automatic with some of the people he has aligned himself with right now. Because what a lot of people don't understand is that as soon as the presidency happens and before the cabinet is chosen, lobbyists get their say. And no matter who you are, uh, lobbyists are quite, quite powerful. I just want to throw that part out there. Because you do have people like Vivek Ramaswamy, who has been a huge Trump supporter ever since he lost the Iowa caucus. And uh, probably a very intelligent and strategic move on his part for his own future. But if he is in the cabinet somewhere, he is somebody who is all about just letting everything burn to the ground in terms of a recession. Suck it up, eat shit, and let things play out the way it needs to play out. Which I think most of us here could probably uh, agree with that, that that is what needs to happen. Um, it's going to be wildly unpopular uh, because most people are all about their own instant gratification because they've been conditioned to want that over time in the United States. But if Vivek is in the cabinet somewhere and we do see a recession, I do know he's probably going to be one of those voices that will advocate for not using dirty tricks to try and get out of this thing as soon as possible. Uh, so there's one thing I will say. Now, in terms of the things we like to invest in, let's start with the United States dollar. Um, I would expect the United States dollar in the first year, probably two, to become weaker uh, because that is what Trump likes, uh, because it is good for trade. It is good for economies. And he was able to pull this off in the first two years of his first term. 
Yeah, and then over time, things got a little bit more back to normal. But it never, the dollar itself never, if you go look at the DXY, never got to the levels it was uh, towards the very end of the Obama administration. So this is not financial advice, and we may even have an episode on this. But it might be time to take your USD and maybe start diversifying it a little bit. Now, I really like having USD as recession insurance because that really is the one thing that always goes up when recessions start. But when I say one thing, I mean, all fiat currencies tend to do pretty well here. Uh, just the USD does better because investors know the same thing we know here. You know, at the end of the day, the USD is really the one safe haven when things like recessions occur. So maybe this doesn't give you complete clarity on things like the United States dollar. But again, this is probably something we'll be talking about more on the show. Uh, moving over to oil, uh, this is going to get really, really interesting, I think, because I'm, I'm pretty sure the Trump administration is going to want to undo a lot of what was done uh, during the Biden administration when it comes to uh, restrictions on fossil fuels and in terms of opening pipelines that were previously shut down. Um, they really, really are big into the United States using its energy abundance and maxing it out as much as they can uh, because energy is life and with energy comes prosperity. And it takes a lot of energy to run a lot of what we're seeing with AI. And if the United States is going to stay ahead in that race, it's going to need all the energy it can. Now, this is, again, something we're probably going to go deeper into on the show, but I would say for right now, um, drill baby drill is typically not great for the price of oil. <laughs> I mean, that's you're, you're bringing up supply a lot. Uh, so maybe you have to go a little bit deeper here. The oil producers might not be your best bet, but the oil industry is not just about producers. Over the last few episodes, I've been talking about a site called Finviz, which is a really great free stock screener. It's called F-I-N-V-I-Z, Finviz. And you can see um, all the different sectors related to oil there once you start sorting stocks out. And you will see it's not just about producers. There's a lot that goes into the oil ecosystem. And if you can start maybe looking more towards other sectors within the oil sector, not producers... I think there could be some real opportunity there, and uh, those stocks typically pay a dividend as well. And when the stock market itself is down, oil as a whole typically does very well. Now over to gold, I think with the Kamala victory that gold will continue to go up. I think with the Trump victory, gold might see quite a retracement from where it is right now. Um, I am pretty much forever bullish on gold long term. But a retracement wouldn't be terrible news, really, because we here at the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast are all long-term investors, and any drop in price is generally good for us, because now we can buy things cheaper than we normally would. Uh, so possibly good news for gold investors if you're looking at it that way. Uh, for the miners, it will continue to be frustrating because miners, as we know, are stair-step up, elevator down. And if we're going to see a retracement in gold, they will continue to fall. So you might want to decide if you're going to take a little bit of profit on those when the time comes. Because if you give those suckers any reason to drop and drop a lot, uh, they're going to take it. Now, when it comes to other forms of energy, pay very close attention to where RFK ends up. If he ends up in a position of power, this is actually going to be very bullish for green energy. Now, green energy might seem to be the antithesis of fossil fuels, but again, uh, if, if this is played correctly, in my opinion, you know, if you are the United States, you want access to as much energy as possible, regardless of where it's coming from. And Robert F. Kennedy has absolutely guzzled the green Kool-Aid, and he's all about solar and wind, and he's been very public about this. And a lot of stocks in the solar and wind category have dropped in the past few years. So there might be some real opportunity there. Now, if RFK is in the cabinet and he is in charge of energy, I hate to say this, but uh, you might be very careful when it comes to your uranium holdings. 
because I have not seen him talk very favorably about it. He is more about what has been marketed, at least, what has been propagandized as green energy. So solar and wind, uh, despite their many, many faults, yeah, he seems to be a really big advocate of. Uh, far less so uranium. Again, this can all change, but this is what I have seen so far, at least from him. And uh, I think we should end it probably with crypto because this has been a really big uh, talking point uh, from a political standpoint. And honestly, there's this concept I call ghost stories, for lack of a better term, to where especially right towards the election, people really start getting extreme with all these scare stories about what might happen if this person gets in. And you see it on both sides. With, uh, with Trump, it's like, oh, he's going to outlaw being gay. He's going to make a, a national uh, abortion ban. And none of these things are likely to happen at all. Um, but people get desperate around this time. And what people are saying on the left is if the left gets elected, you know, kiss your crypto goodbye, uh, which is complete nonsense. Uh, we have seen a, a very adversarial and divisive administration uh, these past four years when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Yet what have we seen these past four years? You know, nothing but price going up, adoption going nowhere but up, uh, technological breakthroughs in the space going nowhere but up, and TradFi getting on board more than they ever did in the past. That whole movement has done nothing but get stronger and gain momentum. Now, would these things accelerate with a Trump victory? Uh, I would say likely, yes. Like I said, everybody, uh, as far as the main people who are supporting them, are all crypto advocates. They're crypto holders, and they think this regulation is foolish. Yeah, and they would finally, you know, maybe not completely get rid of, I don't know if you could, but, you know, defang you know, the pigs out there like Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler, uh, which would really clear a path in the United States for the crypto industry as a whole. But even despite the roadblocks that the left would probably continue to put up, uh, we've seen, if the, four, the past four years are any indication, that it just doesn't matter. Uh, so I will continue to be very bullish on Bitcoin and the crypto industry as a whole, understanding until that correlation, that dirty correlation between Bitcoin and the TQQQ is broken. And it has not broken yet. And it may not in these next four years. Uh, the one thing I'm probably more bullish on uh, than anything else in the next four years is going to be Bitcoin. You know, I think the rest of the industry will continue to grow but it will also continue to change. And so even though I'm bullish on the industry as a whole, I can't comment on it as much in the next four years because you know how this technology moves. You know, four years is like 30 years. And who knows what we're going to see. But with all that I have seen go on with Bitcoin and the adoption and the advancements in the ecosystem, if I really, really had to, was forced to put my chips into one thing for the next four years, Regardless of who wins, probably going to be Bitcoin. So this has been my very amateur and rudimentary take on the overall election. I hope that you understand that the main theme of this is to focus on the things that really matter and focus less on the things that matter a lot less and things we cannot control and the things that are only there to screw with our emotions and force us into bad decision making. Oh, and speaking of, if you enjoyed this, uh, even if you don't really watch... Uh, or listen to, I should say, the uh, the Trading Psychology podcast. We are going to have an election-focused episode of that tomorrow, uh, Monday the 4th. So if you're looking for a more good election talk on the things that matter, uh, less so the things that really don't, then check out that episode as well. Uh, but I would just like to remind everybody again that what we're about to see is probably going to be pretty wild and pretty chaotic. But regardless of what happens, do not allow it to make you crazy. Simply take what it gives you and just be early. <laughs>